Uh, my name is Stephen Barber and along with uh, Professor Fran Lloyd, I'm one of the co-directors of the Visual and Material Culture Research Centre at the Kingston School of Art faculty, Kingston University. That's one of the four research centres based there. It's a centre spanning research into contemporary cultures, cultural histories, art, film, photography, fashion, crafts, uh, digital media. And one of our ongoing projects at the centre is to explore imageries and preoccupations with home. And this connects to one of the centre's ongoing international research projects directed by Fran Lloyd with Azadeh Fatehrad titled Making It Home on the Study of Migrant Homemaking and the Politics of Integration. Uh, today's event is the final one in a series of three that we've been having. And uh, tonight's event has a historical focus. Uh, the event is going to be in two parts. The first part devoted to the photographic and moving image innovator Edward Moybridge. And then the second part to the artist Dora Gordine. And both of them are figures that we've been uh, researching in recent years at our centre. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end. And the event is being recorded for our YouTube channel so um, anyone who uh, doesn't want to be uh, doesn't want their uh, their face recorded uh, for, for the YouTube channel uh, probably needs to turn off their, their cameras. Uh, so I'll be speaking about Moybridge's time in Kingston along with Seyung Kim. Seyung is the curator of the Moybridge collection at the Kingston Museum and I'm really grateful to Seyung for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Um, and uh, so we're going to start by talking about Moybridge. And uh, I think what I'd like to ask uh, Sei Young to do first uh, is to tell us about Moybridge's early life in Kingston, the first 20 years of his life there in Kingston. And, uh, and I know you have uh, some images that you're going to show us. OK, well, first of all, thank you for the invite to this interesting, exciting event. I just hope uh, my internet connection be here because it's been a bit funny. But anyway, I will start. So this old man, grumpy looking old man is Edward Moybridge. The picture must have been taken uh, when, he, when he returned to Kingston, uh, you know, for late, latest life. So he was born in uh, as Edward James Moybridge in um, Kingston in 1830. And he was baptized at the church in Kingston called All Saint Church. And he uh, was actually was born as a second son. Uh, he had uh, three more brothers, one older brother and two younger brothers. His father was grain and coal uh, merchant and his mother uh, side has a business uh, running a lo local barge uh, company. Well, big business rather. Uh, he grew up at a uh, uh, house uh, in a kind of middle Thirty High Street. So if you, oh, you just see this uh, plaque. Just cut yeah. out there, say I'm sorry. So you said that he grew up where? Sorry, his childhood. Yeah, he grew. Up, yeah, he grew up at the address of uh, Thirty High Street. So the plaque you are showing, the, you you can see now. You can see that um, uh, the property. If you go to Kingston now, so it's still existing. The building still exists. Um, and uh, although we do not have a firm uh, evidence, it's very likely he studied uh, uh, at the local school. Current name is Kingston Grammar School. Uh, unfortunately, the school doesn't have a registry uh, record, so I obviously cannot prove, but there are plenty of evidence uh, to suggest he studied there. I just want to read a very interesting account written by his cousin, uh, the, she said in a memoir in, at her uh, later life, Mybridge, Mybridge was an eccentric boy, rather mischievous, always doing something or saying something unusual, or inventing a new toy or a fresh, uh, uh, fresh chick. So, you know, this kinds of character did exist uh, when he was a little boy as well. Um, so at, at his age 20, he decided to make name for himself to discover a new world. 
So he left UK and he, he went to uh, US. Uh, because today's talk is about his connection to Kingston, I will skip that <laughs> sort of his career part in the US. So we will continue to talk about that. Next slide, please. So the, another very interesting thing about my bridge is, as you may know, he his name changed. So his, his name is Edward James Mogridge. But when he, was, when he was about 25, 26 years old, he changed his last name to Mogridge. And about 10 years later, he changed again of his last name to Moybridge, the, the, the name you know of. And when he's about 60, 61, he finally changed his first name. So this Christian name, was a normal Edward, you know, the normal way of spelling, but he changed that to Anglo-Saxon spelling, which you can see on the screen. Um, the, the stone you see, you are seeing is called the coronation stone, which you can find in Kingston. This stone is known to be used uh, during the Anglo-Saxon king's coronations. Um, so some way this historical sort of connection, uh, you know, of, of influenced his name change. Um, but as a sort of a unofficial name change, he's got two more names. One is that uh, he temporarily used the name called Eduardo Santiago Moybridge. So that's the name he used in Central America during his visit in 1875. And then the last one, which is an unfortunate one, you know, in her, um, on, on his gravestone in the walking cemetery, is, they, I assume it's a mistake, they misspelled his last name as a Maybridge. So it's spelled M-A-Y instead M-U-Y. So whether, he, whether it was intended or not, he had five names, which is very unusual for normal person. Yeah, I, I will hand it over to Stephen now. Yeah, thank you very much, Seyoung. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about Moybridge's return to uh, to Kingston on Thames uh, 40 years later. And Seyoung, if uh, you know if you would like to add anything while I'm speaking, then you know, just uh, uh, interrupt me, please. Uh, next slide, then, uh, please, Helena. Uh, so by the early 1890s, Moybridge had been based in the USA for over 40 years, though he'd made several visits back to Europe in that time. And uh, he'd undertaken a, a projection tour of many Central European cities in 1891 that was spectacularly successful, with audiences awestruck by Moybridge's moving image projections in every city. So why did Moybridge return home to Kingston from the USA in 1894? Well, after his uh, European tour of 1891, he started planning a uh, world tour that would extend to Japan, India and Australia. And so he spent about a year planning that tour, but then he suddenly decided instead that he was going to take part in the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. This was going to be a vast and prestigious event of technological innovation. And he must have thought that this was the perfect showcase for his work. And so he preferred to do that than making his world tour. So he himself designed and financed his own auditorium for his moving image projections there. It's called the Zoo Praxographical Hall. And uh, uh, can we have the next slide, please, Helena? That's Moybridge's design. But this is the uh, building as it was actually uh, constructed um, on the Mid Midway Plaisance Avenue of the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. So it wasn't exactly what he'd had in mind. It looks a much smaller building than, than the, the, the great um, uh, uh, auditorium he'd uh, envisaged. Now, his participation at the World's Columbian Exposition was not a success. Uh, his work there was seen as obsolete. And uh, his decision to locate his auditorium in this entertainment area of the exposition called the Midway Plaisance was badly chosen. And over the two months that uh, he ran the 
to Pratt's graphical hall. He only made a total of three hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, he had one thousand two hundred and eighty spectators. That's around thirty a day for every day he operated the hall. Uh, each one paying twenty five cents. And uh, his uh, he uh, his uh, projection hall was ranked forty first of the forty one. Uh, Midway Plaisance exhibit exhibitors. So uh, 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 he had uh, very, very little success with the Zuprax graphical hall. And after two months, he decided that he had to abandon his projections, which he'd intended to last for six months. And uh, he, he sold this auditorium on to another exhibitor, and it was renamed the Pompeii Panorama. Now, on his return to Kingston, Moybridge was 64 years old, and he'd been traveling in an itinerant way in, US, in the USA and in Europe for 44 years. So it may also have been that he was simply exhausted, and that was the way that uh, that was the reason why he decided he was going to return home. So he returned uh, to Kingston from New York, from New York City. So in the reverse direction that he, that he had made his journey 44 years earlier in 1850. Though very strangely, he told his relatives, his cousins, when he arrived back in Kingston, that he had returned from Japan. And uh, this is a complete mystery, and maybe because his Chicago experience had been so bad that uh, he hoped that they would uh, think that he'd come from somewhere more exotic. Uh, but they may have just misunderstood what he was saying. So that's uh, uh, um, uh, not known why Moybridge told his relatives that he'd come from Japan. So next slide, please, Helena. OK, so uh, where did Moybridge live in Kingston? What did he do there? So he had three main homes during those final 10 years of his life. The first of them uh, was a boarding house room, the Chestnuts Boarding House. Uh, this uh, boarding house, unfortunately, was demolished in the 1930s, but there are some street plans of it. And this is a street plan from 1895. It's the uh, building you can see in the center of the image there. Uh, next slide, please. So what did Moybridge do there? He constructed a great scrapbook, uh, assembling together materials that he had gathered in provisional forms over the preceding 40 years. And so he uh, constructed this great uh, one book of his work, which he intended for future research as the scrapbook. Uh, next image, please. And on the first first page of the scrapbook, he writes uh, the chestnuts here at the bottom of the slide here. And you can see all of his addresses over the preceding years, uh, the one above 853 Broadway in New York City, and then the chestnuts, this boarding house, small boarding house room that he had um, at the rear of the building where he lived for about five years. The other project he had during his time at the Chestnuts was to have his final moving image projection tour. And this went on between 1895 and 1897. So he went right around the UK, all the way from uh, Edinburgh to St Ives in Cornwall, uh, projecting his work in arts clubs and in the auditoria of town halls. Uh, and uh, he had some success with this uh, with this tour and uh, perhaps went to around 100 venues. Uh, but then that tour came to an end in 1897. Uh, can we have uh, next slide, please? Uh, this is Moybridge's promote a bit of Moybridge's promotional fly in which he advertises the tour to prospective um, bookers. And as you can see, he's still writing the chestnuts Kingston on Thames as uh, the place where people should uh, contact him. OK, next slide, please. Uh, so after about five years, I think this is in 1899, Moybridge moved on to 161 Kings Road uh, on Kingston's new Cambria estate. This was a newly built estate. Moybridge always loved what was new. And so I think this is why he moved to um, uh, 161 Ca uh, Kings Road. And he had the upper story of this, uh, this house. Uh, I met the owner a few years ago who told me that um, he was converting the house. And so the, the lower story, which was a milliner's shop at the time that Moybridge lived there, uh, finally, it would all become one house for the first time. So this is 161 Kings, Kings, uh, 161 Kings Road. Uh, next slide, please. And what Moybridge did, at least for part of the time that he was at 161 Kings Road, was to write letters to the Times. 
uh, which is a great uh, retirement thing to do, I guess. And uh, so he uh, wrote these uh, uh, these letters um, um, talking about his uh, uh, the, his work of the previous decades. Uh, next slide, please. And it seems that Moybridge had, had perhaps sold all of his photographic cameras, so he didn't photograph in Kingston on Thames during the final decade of his life. But it seems he had a telescope, and this is the cap of Moybridge's telescope. And as you see, he's written his address, his current address, 161 Kings Road, on the cap of the telescope. Uh, yeah, next slide, please, Helena. Um, so in 1902, after being at Kings Road for th about three years, Moybridge moved on uh, to Liverpool Road, and this time he had an entire house. He was living there with one or two of his cousins, but uh, he was uh, going up in the world um, from his boarding house room uh, to this um, uh, to this uh, much larger. Uh, house, perhaps because his moving image tour had been quite lucrative. He charged uh, 10 guineas for every projection. Uh, this house is still standing, and uh, Moybridge's projects uh, for the, in this uh, last house were mostly conducted in the back garden. Uh, can we have the next image, please? And uh, this is an image by the artist Becky Beasley, 8th May 1904, Kingston, in Moybridge's back garden. Um, and uh, it seems that Moybridge was engaged in digging a large swimming pool in the back garden. Uh, it seems that he told neighbours that he, it was going to be in the shape of the Great Lakes of uh, the USA. But he was also busy uh, concealing some of his photographic negatives, which it seems that he was digging holes in order to hide them, some of which uh, are still uh, hidden there to the, to the present day. Um, and uh, there are also stories that Moybridge actually died in the back garden of, of this house at uh, 2 Liverpool Road, uh, close to the uh, Kingston entrance to um, um, uh, Richmond Park, uh, while building, the, uh, while digging this, uh, this uh, uh, swimming pool. And you can see from the image, I'm not sure if this is a, uh, the, the contemporary version of Moybridge's uh, swimming pool or whether it's a completely different swimming pool, but there is still a swimming pool in the back garden of Moybridge's final house. And he, he died in this house in uh, 1904. So Moybridge had returned uh, to Kingston with his own personal archive, this vast personal archive. And so the archive also needed a home at the end of Moybridge's life. And uh, next slide, please. Now, in, 1903, in 1903, May 1903, uh, the world's richest man, Andrew Carnegie, the steel tycoon and philanthropist, came to Kingston on Thames. Um, to open the Kingston Library, which he had partially funded as part of a great agenda. He had to build many, many public libraries in the UK and also in the USA. So you can see uh, Andrew Carnegie in this photograph. He's the short man with the walking stick and the hat at the, in the uh, front row there with the white beard. Uh, and uh, yeah, the world's richest man at this at this time. And while he was opening the uh, uh, Kingston Library, it seems that uh, he decided that he was also going to fund a museum as well, and uh, that he would offer the funds for the construction of a of a of a museum. And whether Marbridge was there while this opening was taking place is not quite known, but uh, um, uh, Moybridge must have been impressed by this and decided that uh, he would um, uh, uh, bequeath his archive to the Royal Borough of Kingston, you know, with the idea that it would be then uh, shown in the Kingston Library or the Kingston Museum. And the next slide, please. And uh, uh, it was six years after Moybridge's death. So Moybridge died in 1904 before the Kingston Museum had actually been uh, completed. The Kingston Library had been completed in 1903, but the museum itself was uh, completed about four or five months after Moybridge's death. And uh, so uh, the first cinema appeared in Kingston in 1910. And at the opening event of this uh, uh, this cinema, the mayor of Kingston announced that firstly, the inventor of moving images was from Kingston on Thames. This was Mybridge, a great Kingstonian and from a, an, a, Saxon, a Saxon family. 
Uh, and also he announced that the uh, Moybridge's archive was ab available to be seen by the, uh, uh, the inhabitants of Kingston and that it was on view in the public library. Uh, so I'd like to ask Sayum to tell us more about uh, the Kingston collection, the uh, Moybridge collection uh, and its uh, contemporary existence uh, um, uh, after this, uh, after over a century since uh, Moybridge's death. Yeah, yeah. So, so the picture here, so the, So 1504, it looks pretty safe. Oh, you, you're free. He was very good friends with. Am I? Mm, am I frozen? Am it's I okay frozen? Now. It's okay. me? Yeah, yeah. So he was very good friends with uh, uh, the Kingston Library's uh, librarian called Benjamin Carter. In fact, Benjamin would have been my British first advocate uh, after his death. So Benjamin wrote an article uh, to um, basically uh, to tell the world about my British work and everything. And uh, he probably somewhat influenced my British decision uh, to donate his personal holding to Kingston Museum at that time. Uh, next slide, please. So we have large collection. We are one of the Kingston collection is one of the four uh, preeminent collection uh, of my British material worldwide. And strength of collect our collection uh, is a lot to do with this lantern slide, glass lantern slide. So we have uh, more than 2,000 images of these beautiful images. They are, because they're, the medium uh, is glass, they are very crisp. It's not like a paper one which is fade. So it's a, Amazing images are captured in this uh, glass lantern slide. Next, please. I'm going to show you just a couple. Again, some of the images uh, capture this uh, setting of Palo Alto experiment. And next, please. And obviously, the very famous image of a uh, horse galloping. And next. And ma many images uh, showing that his work in Universal Pennsylvania. Next. And obviously, as you as you may know, his most famous work was published in 1887, Animal Locomotion. Next. Uh, so again, another image of that. Just lost you for a moment, Sia. Oh, sorry, my internet is really bad. Yeah. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, you could always turn your camera off and then it might uh, mean that you're, we can hear you, but then we can't yeah, see you. Okay, yeah, okay, okay, let's yeah. do that then. Yeah. yeah. So next, uh, the next slide is showing the, the famous, the one and only, <laughs> the duplexoscope. So it's one of the very early motion in, uh, moving image projectors. So my bridge built that in, uh, in 1879. So it's, you know, it's really early uh, compared to many other devices in cin cinema history. Next slide, please. Along with the zooplexoscope, we have many uh, 69 discs like that. So there are uh, about half is a 12, a 12 inch disc in black and white. And then the other half number is colored disc. And this colored one is special because these are the ones which my bridge wanted to show at the Chicago World um, ex Exposition, which Stephen mentioned earlier. Next, please. Another highlight is 1878 San Francisco Panorama. There are only nine uh, copies of this uh, really amazing work uh, existent in the world. Next, please. And the, again, one and only scrapbook, which Stephen mentioned already. So this is very, it obviously it contains the newspaper cutting. So it doesn't contain like my British photographic work, but, but because of his a very unique autobiographical quality of this work, it is one of uh, our highlights. Next slide, please. So, so what can you see uh, about my visit in Kingston? So this is one of those land sort of a land in Kingston can see this uh, by the river. 
You just cut out there for a moment, so um... I'm very sorry about this. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I just want to talk very briefly about what we have uh, uh, sort of plan planning wise. So we have many exciting plans for my research collection uh, uh, in Kingston. So next, the immediate one is uh, September 2022 to March 2023. We're going to have a community-led MyBridge inspired exhibition called In Motion, Your Stories. So this is going to be very exciting sort of first uh, attempt to involve community uh, to create this very exciting exhibition uh, with us. The second one is probably exciting for many researchers out there. Uh, the collections, which is currently stored off-site store, which is like 80 miles away from Kingston, is finally coming home after, uh, let's say, eight years of absence. So hopefully it will happen this year, uh, but I cannot tell you the exact date yet. Uh, next one is again very exciting for us as well as the researchers and general public as well. We, we got external funding from Paul Mellon Center. So I've been working on this cataloging project. So hopefully we can have our collection available online uh, from 2023 or 2024. And the last one, which university is heavily involved, is international conference on the title of Moving My Bridge. So we're gonna talk about how My Bridge himself moved from England to America, to Europe and all over the world and how his collection sort of moved uh, from America to here and the other collections in America as well. You know, if you have any great... I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm very it's sorry about my internet. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those days, it's a very temperament. Yeah. So, Yanga, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just ask you one question uh, before we hand over to uh, Jonathan and Fran and Brenda. It must have been a momentous decision that Mybridge uh, took that um, the Kingston Library would, was going to be the home for his uh, personal archive, you know, after he'd been collecting it for 30 or 40 years in the USA. Do you think he had a, a sense of its future existence, that people would still be interested in it after 120 years or so? I think so. I mean, he, he was very, very conscious about uh, leaving his legacy. You know, I think the, among other big Mybridge collections, we are the only one who he willfully left his legacy uh, to institution. Also, as you mentioned earlier, he buried his uh, glass negative and positive in the garden, meaning he didn't want people to see them. So he was very much, uh, I think, aware of what he was doing. Uh, interesting, he mentioned in his will as if he was leaving his collection for benefit of Kingston people. So, so I mean, like many things about my bridge did, uh, you, you, I think, I personally think you have to take uh, what he said with a pinch of salt. But what did it show is that he was aware of is he is leaving the, his personal material to our institution so he that can survive and preserve. Yeah, I think it's possible to see that, especially in, in the scrapbook itself, because he very much distilled and edited down what he felt was really important about his work, what was most innovative and experimental, so that future researchers and, and the people of, of Kingston who would come into the library to see his, see the scrapbook would get a sense of, uh, you know, uh, what was most uh, innovative and experimental about what he had done. So, uh, yeah, it is a really important archive and absolutely crucial for uh, understanding Moybridge's work. Uh, so, Helena, shall we hand over now to uh, Jonathan and Brenda and Fran for, for their, their presentation? Yeah, yeah, please, please begin. Um... Fran, you say you have to unmute. Right, so the presentation is visible. Yeah. OK. Um, 
So also Richmond Park figures here in um, this uh, second part, which is uh, a presentation around um, Dora Gordine. And um, like my bridge, um, she travelled a lot and ended up in Kingston. And what is fascinating about her is that in many ways, especially at the moment where there's a lot of research around home, about where one comes from, how home is important, how we think of it as something very um, sedentary, as fixed. Dora Gordine, her whole life, it, it, she's intriguing because she offers an alternative to that. Um, the sense of she's always on the move and across geographies, she uses that in terms of her networks to establish a home. And in this part, we're really asking some questions about what kind of home she made. Uh, what was the purpose of the home for her as a as a woman sculptor? Um, and what was important in the home to her? You could say in terms of her homemaking, which ranges across obviously professional status as a, uh, a sculptor networks, patronage, but also, and this is intriguing, and it echoes Mybridge in many ways, how home for her was a new home, a new place, was also the ability to establish a new becoming uh, and to create an identity. Uh, as we'll hear for Gordine in particular, a sense of reinventing herself and new spaces. She had multiple real and imaginary homes <laughs> and um, we're interested in, in how in particular she used um, that sense of making a home, what was important. So this is Storage House where um, she was uh, where she ended up and, and died. And en route, she, in moving between these different places, she took work ideas from previous places and reinvented them. Uh, we're not going to concentrate on that here because we're going to focus on homemaking. But I just wanted to raise that point about the way in which she will uh, work that was created in Paris or in um, in this case in Singapore reappears. Um, this is her Singapore garden, but it reappears later. We'll see it reappearing in um, Dorage House, her final abode. But she was also amazing about recreating her work for different contexts, the public and the private between that same work, here it is in Battersea Park in 1948, a postcard of it, and a work that had a very different context is shown in a new context. And that's one of the fascinating things about Dora. So I'm going to now pass over and introduce. So Brenda Martin, delighted that you um, can join us for this looking at different sides of Dora. Gordine's homemaking and Brenda was the, um, I'm going to say the original curator of Dorridge House before it was a museum and really established the museum and um, it's a huge feat and so knows the work immensely. And then we'll pass on to Dr Jonathan Black who was the first research fellow to work on Dora Gordine and all of the um, endless uh, different trails that that encountered. So hand over to Brenda. 
thank you, Fran. Can can you hear me all right? Can, is my is my sound on? Yeah, that's all good. Yes, yes, yeah, it's, all yeah, good. it's all good. Okay, um, thank you, Fran. So, um, focusing on on the obviously, there's so much stuff about Gordine's work and life um, for this this um, conversation we've I've focused on the home and um, for Dora Gordine as Fran has said the the concept of home was transient but crucially um, it was always connected to her work as a sculptor this is something it took me quite a while to get a handle on in the first place because if you imagine home as being a domestic space this doesn't really relate to Dora at all um, she was dedicated to her work as a sculptor. It was her life. And as she says in interviews, um, which are in the Dorich House archives now, um, her sculptures were her children. And she also said in another interview, um, when she was um, being interviewed by Nancy Wise for the BBC for a series, A Second Home, about people that had made their home in England, um, what she thought about home. She says, if you want to know me, look at my work so directing people back again to her work um, and in Dora's homes she also had a division between the public and private spheres of her homes that was carefully crafted and thought about it um, her Jewish family arrived in in Lee Balak the, uh, around about 1900 um, they were part of the ever moving tide of emigrants whose whose home was not a fixed place and perhaps this laid the foundation for how Gordine um, operated. Um, when she was 18 Dora moved with her family to Tallinn in Estonia and from there she lived briefly in St Petersburg for art training and then back to Tallinn as the Russian Revolution um, uh, gathered pace. Uh, Paris came next in the early 1920s where she was able to design her first studio home, commissioning the modernist architect August Perry to build it for her. And that's what's showing on the on the screen at the moment. Um, it was in a new area just outside of Paris, Boulogne Biancourt, so not in the um, traditional artist quarter, um, but a, a modern area. And um, you can see the influence of Perret's use of um, reinforced concrete in the way that the pillars are made and the front is made um, but especially we can see the attention to detail for her studio because the black um go back one please that the black panel in the front is it can open up and gives direct access to the studio so next pan next side um here is dora inside her studio at the front there with you can see the the panel behind her working on um, the plaster of walking male torso and um, standing in the foreground is goddess of health um, everything set up for her a superb timetable a raised dais for the model to be in um, next slide um, that's in the studio in the rue de Bel belvedere paris studio and across the way in the gallery, this is where she creates a sitting area. So the fireplace is designed by Perret, um, but either side of it, Gordine has placed very modern um, chairs from um, to do with the um, Paris interior decoration movement that was currently fashionable in the 1920s. But also she adds to it some of the Chinese side tables um in deep gleaming mahogany and she always has gleaming wooden floors that but crucially placed around this area of home that she creates by the fireplace are some of her smaller works the works that she's just completed girl with pigtails is on the fireplace um to the uh, right of the fireplace is the head of kwan in which she's recently done and over towards the window um, is an early nude, um, I think it's called American Girl, that one. Next slide. So um, this was um, in the early 1920s and um, they she made her home with most of the space taken up with a studio and um, a gallery um, with living spaces off. Um, 
1930, um, she married Dr. Garlic, a British doctor working in the British Malaya and Singapore. And it took her to Johor Bahru and Singapore, where she lived for five years. Um, she's here's a picture of her in her studio in Johor Bahru. Um, this one is she's had made from um, traditional Malay vernacular architecture. So this is tree trunks and then woven palm leaves in there. But it interests me that she has chosen to have her portrait taken um, working on a sculpture. Um, the house she lived in at this time would probably have been um, a Malay house. But um, with the financing of garlic, she built this amazing building, which was completely round, um, made in concrete. And here we have her gallery on the ground floor. Um, the archways are very typical of what we later find in Dorich House. And in the background off to the left, you can see um, two of the sets of three small rounded slit windows, which are then elongated and repeated in Dorich House. But the whole of this area here is um, conceived and designed by Gordine to view her sculptures. And again, we have the head of Kuan Yin on the right um, and then a gallery up the top to look down into sculpture. Dora was always um, very keen on what height her sculptures were displayed and how they were viewed. Next slide, thank you. So um, newly divorced in 1936, as the Jewish pogroms made a return to Paris increasingly dangerous, she came to London. Um, she married the Honourable Richard Hare and together they built Dorich House. And here you can see them standing on the rooftop, looking out from the roof terrace over Richmond Park. Um, next slide. This is the gallery in Dorich House around about 1936. She's brought the chairs in. So it, this is the actual large gallery on the first floor. It's not the sitting room that's upstairs, their smaller sitting room. And you can see she's created a kind of homely atmosphere around the fireplace here. Um, this floor was very much used to entertain visitors, to show them off, show her work in the gallery. Um, and these were public spaces almost. Um, the um, the gallery is opposite, across from her main modelling studio, um, which you can see a corner of here with um, the hoist coming open with um, a sculpture of Dyak coming up again. Um, to the left is the raised dais uh, for um, to view work up and view work down. And also on the left, you can see the tall slotted window that gives light into the gallery. On the right is the beginning of the very large north facing windows that um, gave a steady northern light into her studio. This was very carefully considered by Dora when she was making making her studio home. Um, next slide. And um, I've just popped this other slide in again. There's a different arrangement of chairs, but in the Dorich House Gallery again. Um, she's just sitting reading here. I would say this is pose for the photographer, but the setup is basically a domestic one, but it's placed in her gallery. So for her, the focus was all around um, her sculpture. Now we're up on the top floor. Um, and you can see the amazing feature of the moon doors, which divides the sitting room from the dining room. There's Dora and Richard Hare around about 1936. Um, so um, in each of the places where she lived, Dora had a studio in which to make art. But the concept of a studio home for her was not that of a single room, a studio with a bed on a mezzanine platform with a central stove. The studio for Dora was always a dedicated place of work, a professional space and distinct from a living space. So go back one. The two homes she was able to design for herself, thank you, um, contained a modelling studio, a wet plaster studio and a gallery. Um, chairs were placed by the fireplace in the gallery and hardwood tables from Southeast Asia were placed nearby. These may be considered rooms in her home as in the public realm, and they were the largest spaces in the architecture of the building. But the private areas of Dora's home, 
this is the sitting room and um, the upstairs dining room, uh, also functioned in relation to her work. They were allocated less space, being smaller, but they were no less considered. They were theatrical scene sets to some extent, in which to entertain guests and display her art. At Dorwich House, dinner guests recalled that at the end of a meal, Dole would throw open the moon doors, which divided the dining room from the sitting room, to reveal smaller sculptures and the Russian and Asian art collection in the sitting room. Next slide. Um, so I will finally, I wanted to focus on Dorwich House, where there is, this is a picture of Dora Gordine coming down the stairs from the first floor landing up to the private area at the top. Um, and please notice the curve of the stairs and the newel post just um, where Dora's coming up to. So um, the way that she's designed Dorwich House is that from a dark hall up a well white up a wide, well-lit, low-rise staircase. Um, the two rooms of the modelling studio and the gallery are entered from a square landing at the top of the first flight of stairs. Um, and ahead, next to some built-in cupboards under the stairs, is um, a WC for visitors. So that keeps the visitors on that, flat, on, on that floor in what I call the public space of Dora's home. It's interesting that the steeper, narrower staircase to the top floor ap apartment, which is showing in the slide here, does not lead straight up from that area, uh, inviting the visitor to go up further. But it turns immediately and again just before arriving in the top floor flat. So buyers, patrons and sitters could easily be confined to the middle floor, um, the public spaces, surrounded by Gordine's work and a pretty impressive gallery and modelling studio. On the top floor, the flat contained a modest living room and two small bedrooms, a small kitchen, um, and, but large built-in storage between the rooms. There was a further private space for the hares, accessed by an even smaller staircase, the roof terrace. Um, a treetop idyll with stunning views of Richmond Park and covered areas for sleeping outside in hot weather and here we have the hares taking tea on the terrace and expanding somewhat. Um, a domestic scene set up for the photographer again I'm sure, um, otherwise the, fr the living was fairly frugal with everything and every care and attention giving over to the galleries and the studio. The decoration was in parchment colours which again was a classic um, colour from the Paris studios to show off the works of art. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there and hand over to Jonathan to take on the story of Dora. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. And now, now we're going back in time to um, some of where uh, Dora Gordine gained her training and so forth. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Fran. <clears throat> yes, this is where the story begins. We're in the world of the Baltic states then part of the Tsarist Russian Empire, and then they became independent uh, states after the First World War. But this was very much Dora's world from the uh, mid 1890s to uh, the late 1920s, when she moved from Tallinn in Estonia to, to Paris full time. But she was actually born, uh, well, you just go back one, please. Uh, thank you. She was actually born, uh, if you just just about see it, in the main port of Western Latvia, which was uh, called in Latvian, it's Liepaja, but for many years it was known by its German name, Liebau, and she was born there in 1895. Well, we have three different uh, birth dates for her in 1895, but uh, it seems that she was born there into a sort of prosperous uh, upper middle class, comfortably off uh, Jewish family um, in, in 1895. So uh, the family had um, property on the Great the Grosse Strasse, which as you can see coming from the, from the uh, south of the bridge across the Baden-Hafen, 
they also had property uh, overlooking the municipal gardens facing the uh, the Baltic uh, the Baltic Sea and they lived uh, the, the the family was uh, uh, at least she had th three brothers and sisters uh, two elder brothers and um, Nikolai and Leopold and one elder sister Anna Interestingly enough, at the insistence of the father, Morduch Mark, who came, whose family came from Dagafpils or uh, Duneborg in eastern uh, Latvia, uh, he, he sent the middle brother, the middle son, Leopold, to study civil engineering at Glasgow University from 1911 to 1914. So there was a sort of connection uh, with Britain from, from that early time, uh, or at least with, with Scotland. And later on in life, Dora would claim that the family's real surname was Gordon. Gordon. Uh, actually, the, uh, fam the, the, the family's name was Gordin, uh, G-O-R-D-I-N, and Dora added the E when she was living in Paris in about 19, from 19, 24-25, but she later in the 1940s claimed that the uh, family name originally had been Scottish, so she was, she was keen to make this connection uh, with, with Scotland. Uh, now, in about 1912, uh, the family moved, or part of the family moved from uh, Libau, Leopaya, in the province of Latvia, to what was then the uh, called Raval, uh, which is now the capital of Tallinn, uh, capital of Estonia, Tallinn. And this, uh, she, they, they lived in at least two places uh, in, uh, or Dora certainly lived in two places in uh, Raval, Tallinn, between 19. Uh, 12 and 1928 and sort of south of the main body uh, the main part of the, of the city is the Tartari Street uh, interestingly enough it was only to, it only just been finished by the pioneering Estonian architect Karl Boermann who was a sort of Estonian Charles Rennie Mackintosh of his day and in fact he knew slightly knew Mackintosh slightly in Vienna where both of them are uh, trained. There's a, there's a shot of it today, or from at least about 10 years ago. And you can sort of see certain little hints of, of Dorich House to come, I think, in, in the design, sort of a Baltic Art Nouveau architecture that uh, Boerman pioneered. But so the uh, Doris family lived on the first floor of, of the, uh, of, of the, uh, Italian of uh, Tartari Street. And here is a shot, one of my favourites, of Dora, who by 1919 was uh, established right at the heart of the Estonian art world. Estonia had only become an independent country uh, early in 1918, and then it was assured with British military help at the end of 1918. So this is in November 1919, where there was the first exhibition of the Estonian art, Artists' Union. And there's Dora right in the center of things, literally behind the most famous Estonian artist of his day, who was the so-called Estonian ruler, uh, August Wiesenberg. So she shows you how she was connect, uh, made, made herself. And this is just you know, give an idea of the sort of uh, art of the world in which she lived uh, and with, um, various um, people from the uh, from sort of bohemian um, uh, circles in Estonia and in Tallinn and also the first signs of her showing interest in oriental art and this is her with a, an oriental vase possibly in Helsinki possibly in Tallinn it just shows you how mobile and transnational she was, even in this early part of her life, 
in that she was sort of moving between St. Petersburg, Petrograd, as it was then called, to, uh, to um, uh, Helsinki and also spending time in Tallinn and mixing with the people such as uh, Pete Aaron here, um, showing off his waistcoat, uh, and some of her, and the My Sisters who were based in, in uh, Latvia and also in, in uh, Helsinki. And they were, uh, it just shows you how sort of, you know, very cosmopolitan in she you know, knew people who were very sort of just as much given to moving as, as she was. And she would, uh, they would meet at, um, at a cafe, a sort of, uh, uh, kind of Viennese style coffee house that her father, who was a sort of property developer by then in Tallinn, had uh, built. Uh, on the uh, at the end of Narva Mint, Narva Boulevard in uh, eastern uh, Tallinn. So he was uh, he, he developed this um, sort of coffee house specifically to appeal to Bohemian types such as the poet here Pete Allen, and, and also sort of the Estonian uh, Bohemian avant-garde uh, artists and painters and so forth. And then this just to show how you can, even towards the end of her life, Dora was prepared to move on, even from the wonderful surroundings of, Dor of Dorich. Uh, one of her la latest, largest works, which is of this huge, large mother and child figure from uh, eight foot long and four foot high. Uh, one cast was commissioned by the, uh, for the Indianapolis, <laughs> Museum of Art in 1964. And it's interesting that uh, Dora had made connections in, in some very useful connections in the city through staying uh, with her husband, the Honorable Richard Hare, who by now is a notable Russian academic and who'd uh, spent time at Bloomington, at the University of Indiana uh, in 1959. And Dora had accompanied uh, <laughs> her husband and he made some very useful contacts and uh, the curator of the Indianapolis Museum of Art had met Dora in 1959 and then four or five years later he was a sort of moving agent in commissioning this this sculpture for uh, for the Indianapolis Museum of Art it was installed in the autumn of 1964 uh, Poor Richard Hare died from a heart attack on the stairs at Torwich in September 1966, aged only in his late fifties. Uh, late and within a few months of, 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 of grieving for uh, her husband, Dora was thinking about moving on to uh, having a purpose-built studio home for her south of uh, Indianapolis courtesy of the Tarzian family, who were a very wealthy uh, American-Armenian family, um, part of the group of subscribers who paid for mother and child for the statue for, for, for Indianapolis Museum of Art in 1964. So for about a decade, there was, this was seriously discussed, um, much discussion as to where this new studio home along a sort of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright look about it uh, would have been built somewhere between Indianapolis, Terre Haute and Bloomington in that sort of tri <coughs> triangle along the White River in southern Indiana. So just, just an indication up until about the mid-1970s Dora was, was sort of seriously hoping that uh, she would be she would be in a position to have a new a new studio home built for her, thanks to the Tarsians in southern Indiana. So so the story could have ended up ended there, but as it happened, uh, she often she she did with some of her patrons. She fell out with the, the Tarsians, and so that uh, you know, so plan came to came to naught, and she decided to stay on at Dorich. And to give the give the uh, house to the, to the to the nation, 
and turn it into a museum with her as a sort of living uh, live curator. That was a sort of the next plan. Uh, and she's remained in Dorwich until her death, just uh, at the end of 1991, just in time for the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which she never used. She wouldn't, uh, she never used the word the Soviet Union. It was always Russia to her. <laughs> Thank you. So um, <coughs> intriguing. Someone, maybe we could say she followed the markets um, where the, there was, she went to Singapore because she heard about commissions. She made a home there, Dorridge. And there's that intriguing side of her, the way that her work takes uh, is embedded then in the places that she goes to and her different studio homes. So we will leave it now. And thank you very much, um, uh, Brenda and Jonathan, and uh, be open for uh, questions. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you all, um, all the speakers. Um, yeah, so... Um, I just wanted to invite the audience now, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can uh, write it in the chat or there's a option as well um, for the reactions thing. You can do a raise hand and then can always invite you to unmute yourself as well um, if you'd like to. Oh, in fact, we've got a question straight away. Yeah, please, if you'd like to unmute <clears throat> yourself, uh, Rosamond. Yeah. Hi. Yes, it's um, my name's Rosamond. I had a question. Um, sort of bringing these two people together in Kingston and, and um, both Mybridge and Gordine very tightly control their identity and uh, a little bit fluid with their identities and how they describe themselves and and I was wondering um, I mean perhaps not but I was wondering if if there was anything about Kingston itself that kind of um, allows allowed both of these people to to do that I mean perhaps Kingston as a, a sort of suburb, you know, on the outskirts of London. Is, is there anything to be said about that? I mean, perhaps not, but I'd be interested to hear everybody's thoughts on that. If, if Kingston as a place kind of facilitated this. Um, can, I, can I answer that? Because, well, not, I won't answer it in time, <laughs> but um, when Dora wanted to uh, live in England, she originally wanted to be up in, in Hampstead where the Willow Road is. Um, and she actually looked at buying a plot there, part of the land that's now become um, Highgate, uh, become the Heath. Uh, but um, planning permission was refused on that plot because she was going to build a modernist house. And it's always intrigued me as to why she chose then the plot on Richmond Park. It had for her uninterrupted views from the studios over trees. Um, we think it was because Richard had an aunt, Lady Paget, who had Paget Place on Kingston Hill, and they came for tea with her, and there was this plot going on Kingston Hill. But what an intriguing question. It always has intrigued me. She wanted the intellectual stimulus of that artist community up in Highgate with Goldfinger and the others that were there. Um, she didn't get it. Um, for me, she um, missed it sadly from after a few years in Kingston. So interesting. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> well, I think it was held there was a regular bus service. <laughs> There's still an 85 running between Putney and and Dorich, because she she never learned how to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, the various husbands were deputed as, as a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. so that was one of Richard's main jobs in life was driving her about. Yeah. I was going to say, I can't imagine Dora Gordine on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many of her sitters came by a bus. Yeah. yeah. Especially at the time when Pat Petrel was strictly rationed for much of the 1940s. Yeah, yeah it's, it is an intriguing question, though, in relation <clears throat> to Kingston. It, it, what it brings to mind for me, I mean, uh, is, of course, there was another key figure that settled in Kingston, 
which was um, Stanley Picker, um, mm. who settled there. So uh, he was living there, you know, the same. He, his life would have crossed with Dora Gordine's uh, on that hill. And, and OK, his factory was nearby, but also it gave him a kind of privacy. And that privacy when they won, when he wanted it, but also at easy access to London. It's very interesting to think mm. about. I mean, obviously for my bridge, it's slightly different because he's going back to his birthplace, mm. place very intimate with. For the others, they are Picker was American coming to London, choosing that location. Um also maybe the character of King's Strange so much. Well, it's lovely because it's got the Thames and Richmond Park. It's mm -hmm. a, a borough. And then there was Bentles from goodness knows when that brought people there. Mm. Yeah, it was well serviced. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, with Moybridge, it's clear that uh, at a certain uh, moment when he was 20 years old, he wanted to escape from, from Kingston. And so it's quite extraordinary that after 44 years, I and mean, it's very itinerant life that he has in the USA, that you know he lives in so many places in, in the USA. At a certain moment, he wants to go back to, to Kingston. Ooh. And so um, you know, this boarding house that he lived in uh, from uh, 1894 to the end of the 1890s is only a few uh, doors down from where he was born in, in the mm. high street in Kingston. So he ended up almost exactly where he was born. And um, uh, yeah, there is a sense with Murray Bridge's life that he wants to very closely control it. And it, this is really Im embodied in this scrapbook yeah. that he spent the final decade of his life working on, uh, that he wants uh, future um, uh, scholars, future researchers, future uh, people who want to know about his work to have a very controlled knowledge of it, that he himself edits and uh, edits things out, emphasizes other, other elements of his life. <laughs> Yeah. He wants to be to to know exactly what he uh, felt was most important about his life and what they shouldn't know about, and uh, but so there is something about Kingston there in in uh, Moybridge's decision that you know he wasn't going to uh, uh, retire or go to another another place anywhere in the world. He was going to return to uh, to Kingston, although it seems that uh, only his uh, cousins were still alive there, so he had no immediate family. And then uh, uh, as, he, as he spent this final decade of his life in Kingston, gradually he was living with his cousins as well in both the uh, King's Road house and then the final Liverpool Road house. He always had uh, at least one, perhaps two of his cousins living there in the house with him. Also, I think it's interesting for the reason why he donated his collection to brand new, you know, which he wasn't built, you know, when he made the decision to donate to the museum, because obviously my bridge was a famous figure. He sold lots of his work to all over the world, really big institution. He was well known. You know, if he wanted to donate his collection to somewhere else, he could have suggested or made a perhaps, you know, perhaps made offers to big name museums. But why a small museum in his hometown? That's interesting. So to me, perhaps that's the new sort of museum element. You know, this is a new thing, this is newness. It is perhaps is attractive to him. Maybe he wanted to start leaving his legacy in a brand new place, which he doesn't have any any you know the previous yeah. history attached to it. So it is very interesting discussion and question to sort of unpack. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah. That was, yeah. Thank you very much for the great question. It also made made me think a bit about like just that the, the space, maybe I was thinking of the Moybridge house, how kind of big it was and having that large garden and then Dorich house as well, just having, yeah, the kind of sense of space that maybe you don't necessarily get in, in other locations. Yeah, when, when Dorich house was built, um, there was only about every other third house on the hill, it was a little country lane and there was lots of land around the houses on either side and the um, I think it was a, the director or the owner of the Daily Telegraph lived next but one I think the house still exists but now it's about three houses up because the, the garden has been sold off and built in 
So um, it was a fairly rural area, but um, yes, within easy reach of London. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and Mowbridge's uh, house in Liverpool Road is uh, also on the edge of Richmond Park, uh, as, as Dora Godin's uh, house was. And it does seem uh, something very strange that happened to Mowbridge in the last two years of his life that he had this large house, because all through the, his decades in the USA, he'd lived in boarding house rooms, as he did when he came back to Kingston. So in Philadelphia, it's documented that he lived in a very, very small boarding house room. When he went to the Chicago Exposition, there was an exhibitor's boarding uh, boarding house right next to Lake Michigan. So that's where he spent uh, his, his time there. But there's something about uh, his return to Kingston that it seems to open out uh, his uh, his horizons a little bit. And so uh, he clearly took full advantage of having this very uh, extensive uh, back garden in the Liverpool uh, Road <laughs> house. And I, I think that he must have made money after this financial disaster in uh, the Chicago Exposition. Oh. Um, uh, the, the moving image projection tour uh, that he uh, that he did from 1895 to 97. I think that he must have gathered to his finances together again. And then the two uh, volumes, uh, uh, popular uh, editions of his work that he published in the in the UK in 1899, 1901. They must have given him another impetus, another financial impetus, you know, to be able to uh, to to have this house in Liverpool Road, which he perhaps bought in conjunction with his cousins. I, I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. about this. And um, so, yes, as I said, he made full advantage of this very, very extensive back garden of the, the house in Liverpool Road. Uh, one thing I perhaps add to that is my left 2,000 pounds to Kingston uh, Museum uh, together with this holding. So I think it's uh, 2,000 pounds at, at that time is quite, quite, quite a large sum. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess that there's something about archives that I'm thinking as well that's just about mm. how... Um, so if he's very kind of on the move a lot, like like, <laughs> how is he kind of transporting everything around with him in a way? If he's got his kind of archive on the move, and then does is there something as well? Maybe with Dora Gordine is you know, and I, I know say, say Jonathan when you were researching her in the in the early days, and that thing of trying to find out information is so hard, and that partly is like because they're move both of them they're moving around a lot, um, and then then they settle at the end um, mm. and have their kind of bigger homes. But I was just thinking about if there's any feeling of like a loss in the archive. I don't know the Mybridge archive particularly, so young, so I don't know if you feel that there are things that maybe got lost or do you feel it's quite complete or? Um... Uh, that's a very interesting question for me because the collection we have, which might be equipped to museum, isn't necessarily deliberate sort of a collecting uh, outcome of it. So he had what we were given to use for his lectures, you see. So it wasn't necessarily, he was, uh, mm. I'm going to keep this for my collection. It wasn't like that. So it's like a living collection. He was using it as if we have our books, you know. It's not necessarily I collect books to make a collection. I collect them because I need them. I use them. So that's a slightly different to like a sculpture or art collection which artists leave to themselves. But uh, it is interesting, but obviously that connects con sort of a link with the legacy issue, you know, but he recognized his living items can may be made as an institutional legacy. I think that's why he uh, made the decision of donation. But yeah, it's a very interesting question. Mm. Yeah, I think the largest portion of um, of Dora's archive ended up with the Royal Society of Sculptors, um, the RBS as was, under, under sort of slightly unusual, even murky circumstances. So there are gaps. <clears throat> they don't have as much as you think they would, sh should have. Um, uh, and the material is still uncatalogued. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they sort of, it, uh, it's not easy to 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 get access, you know, to. Um, so it's still uh, not as straightforward as it, as it could be, you know, to, to get access to. And a certain amount of material, apparently, um, when there was that sort of interregnum when 
Dorwich House was being used as a, as, a, as, a, as a film set by the BBC. There are reports of uh, bin bags full of, of clippings and newspapers and other mm -hmm. bits and pieces being taken into the garden and burnt by the set designers who were clearing it out to, to use it as a, as a film set. You know. mm -hmm. So a certain amount of stuff went up in smoke. Uh, some stuff went to the National Monuments records in Swindon. This was sort of cherry picked by the uh, one of the officials there who just happened to visit Dorwich uh, shortly after Dora's death. And then equally somebody did the same thing from the from the uh, Royal Society of Sculptors. So it was all a bit random, you know? <laughs> it's sort of opportunistic, thankfully, because otherwise it wouldn't, probably a lot of it would have been thrown away, but. Um, it's absolutely, it was, um, oh, hang, hang on. It was absolutely disappointing because we got the house and um, that was under hard hat reconstruction when the university took it on. And then we got the contents of the house back and there was virtually no private papers there at all. No birth certificates, no death certificates. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of address books. There was an address book that was a complete mess because her eyes were going at the end and both her and Richard wrote all over the lines. And, 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 and um, oh dear, then there was another address book in the RBS archive. But yeah, there was nothing really to go on. Visitors books in the last years. And that was it, really. Terrible. Yeah. Another question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I was. Um, another thought I was just having as well was just maybe that. <laughs> just when you're talking about Mybridge and his different names as well, and now thinking about Gordine and her different names, yeah. and that that thing of how you're. Um, how you as you are moving around and making homes in different places as well you can kind of hear I'm going to be this person or have this name and mm -hmm. you know or style myself in a certain way I like that thing that Ed Edward I don't even know how you pronounce it but with the you know the kind of Saxon <laughs> name and that just really interesting isn't it how they're kind of all or they what's it the, the Scottish Gordine like as well mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really fantastic Scottish, but yeah the, that, that door, kind of yeah. yeah the slipperiness of identity but also like how you could style yourself like on and with <clears> different <throat> contexts and uh where you are in relation to different you know homes and places I don't know if anyone had any thoughts uh, about that I, I, did. I think I'm fascinated with uh, Mybridge changing his name yeah <laughs> Every now and again, it's like he thinks, well, I really, I need a new name. <laughs> this is fascinating. So oh. I, I think that's why he, my British is popular even nowadays. You know, he carried, he carried that sort of modern celebrity personality. You know, yeah. you change in the, you know, it's like we, people use some, some people use social media to present themselves, not necessarily how they are, but they, they present them the way people, they, they want people to see them. And yeah. uh, I think I, I I read some article some time ago. Someone with, uh, comparing uh, between my Bridge and Andy Warhol, for example. You know that sort of the persona. You know, I'm I'm sure if my Bridge was living now, he would be very active, Twitter all the time, <laughs> so social media, everything. You know, it was yeah. pretty much like a big self promoter, really. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. It's not uh, so it's, 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 it's sorry. It's <clears throat> Um, I, I was fascinated when you were talking about the change of names and I mean, I I've kind of fight very hard for Spike and then my birth name is Stevie. And then when I came to England, everybody refused to call me Spike. So there's, I think an artist's journey is also a journey of their name, of their identity. But also I think when you're talking about the nomadicness of <clears throat> their home or their homes, it's interesting, it reflects in the names. <laughs> the name is also nomadic. It doesn't sit still, it kind of evolves, it changes, it, it becomes part of that moment. Um, you know, I, and that's that's been absolutely fascinating for me because I'm quite interested on nomadic journeys and how 
it kind of embodies within the artist's home, life, way, way of living, way of seeing, because people identify you in different ways. You know, I have three people call me Stevie, call me Spike, they call me Rabbit. So, <laughs> so it's, it is a very important part of the, the artist or sculptor or writer to have this, this other name that reflects what it is we do. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. It was absolutely um, um, amazing. It's a great point. Yeah, thank you, Spike. Um, Stephen, did you have something? You no, to... uh, I mean it's really just the the same point that Spike was just making. You know, he adapted himself as he moved through the cities, and you know, when he went to Central America, he thought up a new name for himself. Uh, uh, you know, Spanish language name for himself, you know, so he was infinitely adaptable. Mm-hmm. And he always thought about his work uh, in very, very different ways. Sometimes mm-hmm. he was an artist, sometimes a technologist, uh, an entrepreneur, innovator, inventor, scientist. You know, so it constantly changed con- in constant transformation. You know, Se Young said, you know, he was really um, you know, pioneering social media, you know, 100 years before, <laughs> be- before, before social media existed, as well as uh, pioneering moving image projection yeah yeah the question of identity is just so interesting with both of them how they how they present themselves dora was um she was a young up-and-coming artist in paris girl sculptor genius then when she went to singapore she took on so much of that exotic exoticness and became an exotic personality herself but uh, (laughs) never really fitted into the state um colonial society and then, of course, when she came back to England, she completely reinvented herself um, as, uh, well, not Lady Listowel, but um, the wife of a peer of the realm. And yeah. became, the Honourable uh, Dora. Yes. Although she still retained the exoticness. She still, um, <clears throat> yes, she wasn't ordinary. She was exotic. But I think what's so fascinating, and I don't know if it's the same uh, with my bridge, but with Gordine. She she embellished her her past. Yes, you know, these previous homes, you know, fleeing um, the you know Red Army in Saint Petersburg in Russia and so forth. These uh, she laid trails um, of her life that uh, weren't so. so she not only uh, moved around a lot but she imagined (laughs) her past places Uh, did Mybridge do that at all? I think Mybridge more edits things out and so you know for example in this scrapbook you don't read about this seminal event in Mybridge's life where he shot dead to his his wife's lover and then had to flee (laughs) to uh, Central America (laughs) for a year or two you don't see anything like that and there are five or six incidents uh, you know in that in uh, you know Boybridge's life which don't appear in 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 the in the scrapbook because you know in the scrapbook is a narrative yeah. of, of Boybridge's work as well as his life and uh, yeah so it's more of an erasure of uh, of elements in Boybridge's life that you that you experience there rather than embellishments I think we've got something else going back to the social media comment that Se Young said um, in that throughout um, Dora's time at Dorich House, Richard Hare um, was looking after publicity for her and he commissioned photographers who worked for the Evening Standard, the Telegraph and other people to come in and take this huge wealth of official photographs. Um, and in that, um, quite often if some are on the same day, you can see Dora moves her work about to appear in the shot. <laughs> There's also this wonderful shot of them hanging the washing on the line. Um, Richard's holding the washing basket and Dora's pegging it out. And I'm thinking, what is going on with this? This is an official photographer being brought in. What are they putting forward? Um, there's another one of him using the electric floor sweeper on the um, polished floors in the flat. And again, this is an by Larkin Brothers, who did a lot of photography for the press um, back then. It's a huge archive. And, uh, yeah, we have some um, from the local Kingston um, Gazette. Um, June Sampson saved the books of, of the photographers. And there's several taken of Dorich House listed beautifully in their copper plate handwriting in that book. They're, they're on glass. 
um, of when their photographers were called in by Richard Hare to photograph Dorrit House um, and Doris' work. So, yeah, yeah I, I've got a jump in there because when, when um, I attended the event at Dorrit House and you showed us, um, uh, we were showing around the photographs and in relation to the photographs um, about all the details, the furniture and the placement, the, there was one detail that kept cropping up was that flick in her hair. Oh, yes. The yes, kiss that girl. was amazing. Kiss and it, it crops up. Yeah. Uh, um, it's like somebody is like, this is your identity and you've got to keep that little bit of hair yeah. um, placed, which, which I just think just a tiny but significant detail. Yeah, yeah. Of course, Moybridge, he had he had the beard. <laughs> when did when did he acquire that amazing beard? <laughs> because that that was pretty uh, full on even for the late Victorian era. <laughs> of a beard of that dimension, you know, it was unusual. I think. So I don't know, Stephen, if you. Mm -hmm. oh, suit. Do you, do you know exactly when Marbridge grew his beard? Was it when he arrived in New York? Yeah, I mean, it was quite later life. And the one thing funny about it, that beard, that, or that white beard, rather, is that, you know, he had a terrible coach, stagecoach accident. And then apparently he, his hair turned white. And oh. uh, apparently it can happen to people, really, when you have a such, such a stressful trauma, you know, your, your physical feature change. Anyway, so certainly the white beard is not necessarily he wanted to keep that style, but I just I think he didn't care really. <laughs> so it's not the style he wanted to. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. He looks distinguished with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If but you want to look couple... like an Old Testament prophet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he can be very scary Father Christmas um, yeah. <laughs> character in the whole film. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was, he was, he was channeling Charles Darwin. <laughs> yes, well, approach to, you know, more hair to give you more more gravitas. You know? <laughs> yes. More hair suitness. <laughs> I'm just aware of the time, so I think we probably just have to wrap up there now. Mm. Um, uh, oh, Rosamond, did you just have a, a final thing or was it a question? Because I think we might have run oh, out of time. It was a very quick question. Uh, have we not got time? Well, we yeah, we're supposed to finish at eight. Just well, okay. you know, you know. <laughs> all, all I was going to say, I was just going to. It was it was a question, but I could just leave it as a thought. So I was thinking about you know what what everyone's saying about Gordine's um, sort of exoticness and and also um, Mybridge's sort of adoption, being Kingston born from Kingston and his adoption of the Anglo-Saxon spelling. And I was just thinking in terms of them as outsiders or not. Um, Gordine obviously being an outsider, being foreign, but she lived in Kingston for such a long time, um, you know, for decades. And, and I'm sort of thinking in some way she feels less of an outsider in terms of Kingston than maybe Mybridge did when he came back after such a long time away. He maybe must have seemed a bit exotic and a bit different. A lot of people might not have, you know, remembered him because he'd been so long away and, and been away in America and South America. But um, yeah, sorry, we've run out of time, but I, I wanted to hear more on that, but, but never mind. Mm. Mm. That is, yeah, a really interesting point. But yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, we might have to wrap up. So we've got our evenings to enjoy. But um, yeah, that was a great point. So maybe I'll hand back over to Stephen just to... Uh, yes, and just to reiterate what I was saying, that we're going uh, that the uh, the research centre will be instrumental in how, in a, a big international conference on Marybridge's work, moving Marybridge, which I think is going to take place in March 2023. So, uh, anyone here who's interested in Marybridge's work, that is to <laughs> next March. So, thank you very much to all of the participants, to Say Young, to Fran, Brenda, and to Jonathan for their part of the event, and also to Helena for coordinate, coordinating everything so well. Uh, many thanks to everyone for attending and uh, everyone have a have a great evening. <laughs>